We're good. We're good. Praise God. Praise God. If you if you have your Bible, uh, why don't you open to um, why don't you open to Matthew chapter thirteen. Matthew chapter thirteen. We thank you, Father, for your word. We thank you for um, just all that you've um, given us and all that you've promised us, Father. And we are, we are so grateful, Father, for the, the promises that you, you have for us and everything that you've, you've given to us, Father. So uh, we, we ask, Father, that you would uh, open our eyes, open our understanding, help me to be articulate as to what you would want to speak and help me to move out of the way, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I'm going to uh, I'm going to read from the King James Version. It's my old my old faithful. So if it's a little different than in yours, it should should be close enough. Um, so Matthew chapter 13, starting in verse one. The same day Jesus went out of the house and sat by the seaside, and a great multitude were gathered together unto him. So that he went into a ship and sat, and the whole multitude stood on the shore. And he spake many things unto them in, a, in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. So, um, here Jesus says he, he rose out. There's a great multitude, so he had to kind of go out in a boat, and he preached from the boat. And... Have you ever considered, maybe you have considered, when did Jesus come to the understanding that he was God, the Son of God? So here he is. He made all this stuff. And he's speaking to people. And at some point in his development as, as a human, he came to understand that I'm the Son of God, I'm the Savior of the world, and I'm the Christ. And this is where I'm supposed to be uh, doing this. So, so at, um, there's two accounts of this parable of the sower. One's in, in Matthew, one's in Mark, and they're, they're almost identical when you read verses 1 through 9. If you, if you read both of them side by side, they are nearly a copy of each other. But, uh, he, you know, when did he, he understood he came to Christ? And, and you think about the, I was thinking about this, that um, first you had the, uh, the, the announcement to Mary and the announcement to her cousin Elizabeth. And so there was this understanding. And then and Joseph had some dreams about... Um, what was going on and you know don't whatever you do don't leave this woman she's with child from the Holy Spirit which must have just been baffling to these young people living in this little town of, of uh, Nazareth and so um, and then as she was pregnant she went to visit uh, her cousin and and John the Baptist leapt for joy and Elizabeth uh, full of the Holy Spirit makes this proclamation and then John the Baptist is buried and and his father's lips were loosened and he starts to prophesy and uh, and then Jesus is born and there's like shepherds and angels and glory to God in the highest. And, and there's a lot of stuff going on during this whole time where, um, uh, you know, uh, they're, they're all this, you know, like, like if this happened, think about if this happened to you. Wouldn't that be wild? And you have this little child that you're carrying who is, by everything that has happened, is the Son of God and the Savior of the world. But at that point, Jesus doesn't know what's going on. He's just a little baby. I mean, he's, he, he's not aware of, of this thing. And, and, and then um, just turn over for, for a second to Luke chapter 2. 
So in Luke chapter 2, there's, there's, it's probably the best explanation of, you know, after the birth of Jesus, then what happens. So there's, there's two or three instances that happen. Uh, one of them is, or two of them are right when Jesus is, is circumcised. Um, so uh, this guy, Simeon. Uh, he says in Luke chapter 2, let's just say verse 25, And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. The same man was just and uh, devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost was upon him. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And, and then later down, he... Um, well, let's just read. Uh, it says, And he came in the Spirit into the temple... And when the parents brought the child Jesus to do uh, for him after the custom of the law, then he took him up in his arms and blessed the Lord and said, Lord, now let us thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For my, my, mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of by him. So here's this mother and father, first kid, excited about the first child, and they go to the temple, and here's this guy who just takes the child up in his arms and said, salvation is coming through this child. And his mother and father marveled, and then, and then as they're doing that, Anna walks up. And um, verse 36, And there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of uh, Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was of a great age and had lived with a husband seven years from her virginity and was a widow of about four, four score and four years, about 84 years old, which departed not from the temple but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. Here's a prayer warrior woman in the temple, day and night, fasting and praying. And she coming in that instant, just happened to be there, gave thanks likewise unto the Lord and spake of him to all them that looked for the redemption uh, in Jerusalem. And when they had performed all things according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to, Galilee, to their own city of Nazareth. And the child grew, so here it is, the child grew and waxed strong in the spirit and filled with was filled with wisdom and with the grace of and the grace of God was upon him. And then you get a little more insight in the next in the next section where Jesus uh, uh, kind of leaves his parents behind. His parents go to Jerusalem every year, to celebrate the Passover. And here Jesus is stays stays behind and, and mom and dad think that he's over there and uh, but he you know, they think he's with the, the cousins uh, that are in the, you know, over there. Normal, right? And he stays behind, but he is not normal by this point. He is not normal by this point because it says that he was, he was with the... Verse 46, it came to pass that after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. And it's, uh, it's very um, maybe exciting at that time for, for these people in Jerusalem. For all the, the, the doctors and the scribes and the Pharisees to, to hear this coming from a child, it's a little bit more disarming coming from a 12-year-old boy than what, from a, a grown-up Jesus who, uh, who probably was saying the same thing here as he was when he got older. And uh, they could take it when he was younger. They couldn't really take it when he got older. Uh, 
uh, in his life. So, so in verse 52, it says, And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and, in favor with God and man. You know, Jesus said, Mom, Dad, didn't you know I had to be about my father's business? Why were you worried? Didn't you know I, you know, this is where I would be about my father's business? And so, but the verse 52, it does say Jesus increased in wisdom and stature in favor with God and with man. So there was a development that Jesus had where he, he grew. I don't believe, maybe he did, there's not a lot in the Bible that talks about this. There's just not, I mean, this is about it. But I, I think with that, I don't believe that Jesus was born knowing that he was the Son of God. His parents knew, his aunt and uncle knew, his cousin John the Baptist had, you know, there was plans for him too. But his parents must have told him at some point, and then you get to the, to the, the wedding feast of Cana, and, uh, you know, mom says, hey, whatever he tells you to do, go do. So mom knew it. By that point, dad's out of the picture. It, there, you know, Joseph just isn't there anymore in, in, as far as in, in writing. And, um, it, you know, so, so uh, and, and then at Jesus' baptism, by then, this is my son, you know, and the transfiguration where, uh, where uh, uh, you know, God says to, to, you know, I think it was Peter and John who were with him, uh, hey, hey, this is my son. Listen to him. I'm well pleased with him. Uh, so, so there was this development that Jesus had. But here he is back in Matthew 13. By this point, he knows who he is. And he's sitting by the sea in a boat teaching a parable. And so let's go back to Matthew chapter 13 and read what it says. So the same day Jesus went out, starting in verse 1, of the house and sat by the seaside, and great multitudes were gathered together unto him, so that he went into a ship and sat. And the whole multitude stood on the shore. And he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. And when he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them. Verse 5, Some fell upon stony places when they had not where they had not much earth, for with they sprung up because they had no deep deepness uh, of earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they, they had no root, they withered away. Verse 7, some fell among the thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. But others fell on good ground and brought forth fruit, some a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. He who hath ears to hear, let him hear. And the disciples asked him, can you explain this to us? And Jesus answered and said, you know, they asked him, verse 10, Why do you speak unto them in parables? Uh, and just hold that right there. If you go over to verse 34, there's this, there's a statement that Matthew makes. It says, it says, after another parable, it says, All these things Jesus spoke, all these things spoke Jesus unto the multitude in parables, and without a parable spake he not unto them. Every time Jesus spoke to the multitudes, as he was teaching, his style was, he spoke in parables, which were just the, 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 the thing that God had him do, where he, he, he spoke about these, he told stories that people could understand, and there was truth in them, truth about the kingdom of God. So, he answered, verse 11, so, you know, he said, why, why do you always speak in parables? And he said, because unto you 
because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but unto them it is not given, for whosoever hath, to him shall be given, and shall have more abundance, but to whoever has not, from him it shall be taken away, even that he has. Therefore I speak uh, to them in parables, because the, they seeing see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. And, it is, uh, and in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which, which uh, says, By hearing ye shall hear, and not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and not perceive. For this people's heart is wax gross, their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes have closed, lest at any time they should see with their ears. Uh, eyes and hear with their ears, should understand with their heart, and should uh, be converted, uh, and I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. And in verse 17, he says, And uh, verily I say unto you that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which you see and have not seen them, and to hear those things which you hear and have not heard them. Hear now, therefore, the parable of the sower. And he goes on to explain. He goes on to explain. So just flip over to Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. So there's, there's a dual account of Jesus Speaking in the parable of the sower in Matthew 13 and Mark chapter 4, like I said, it pretty much reads almost identical, nearly right there. If you read verse 1 through 9, it's, it's, it's the same. Uh, it does take a departure, though, when they ask him, um, you know, tell us about... Tell us about why you always speak in parables. And verse 10, 11, 12, he, he kind of answers the same thing. But in verse 13, he says, well, verse 12, it says, Then seeing they may not see, they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand, lest at any time they should be converted, and their sins should be forgiven them. And he said unto them, Know ye not this parable? And how will ye know all parables? The sower sows the word. So, verse 13 and 14 are uniquely different where Jesus says, gives the key to all parables. How are you going to know don't you know this parable? And if you understand this parable, you will understand all parables, all the parables that I'm talking about. This one holds the key, and the key is the sower sows the word. The word, the seed is the word of God. Amen. That is the key to every parable. Is the the seed is the word of God, and as Jesus, um, in every parable that Jesus talked, everything that he was saying, he was sowing seed. He was speaking the word, and the word is the seed of God, and he was planting it in men's hearts. And it's, it's still the same today. It's still the same today. When you read the Word of God, this is what happens. Is God takes the Word, and this is the key to everything, is the Word that Jesus plants in the human heart. Amen. And the, the, the tilling of the soil, and the depth of the soil, and Jesus said, look, you know, you got some people who are going to hear. Everyone's going to hear the same message. They're all going to hear the same thing. They all came to him. At that time, they didn't have mass media or anything like that. So, so people came out to hear him. And a lot of people just did not get it. 
because the sower was sowing the word and the ground and how it was tilled in the human heart was different for every person. But the seed is still the word of God. And that is the key to the parable. So the word, um, it was through the word of God that Jesus started to understand, I believe, you know, his parents told him, parents told him, hey, look, you're the son of God. You know, we had the angel thing that happened. We had the, uh, the shepherds came, the angels came, glory to God in the highest. Man, you should have been there. <laughs> well, I was there, but, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I did have something to do with that, by the way, Mom and Dad, you know. <laughs> Just want to let you know. Uh, but can you imagine being Jesus and reading through the scriptures? Now, you had the Old Testament at the time. And you're reading Genesis. And you're saying, and this Holy Spirit is upon you. You're saying, I was there. That was me. I was there at the beginning. And you're reading through the flood and Sodom. I was there. I was there. I went down with the two angels and we had a conversation with Abraham. And we, we discuss things, and we, 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 uh, we you know, I, w I was there. And, uh, you know, a lot of this was, you know, a lot of, a lot of this thinking is, uh, you know, I was um, reading in um, John chapter 8, where, uh, and, and this, this has been something that's been kind of rumbling around in my mind for a long time about, you know, this guy who comes to Jesus and he says, and he's got his one moment with, <laughs> with the creator of the universe, and he says, brother, divide, <laughs> hey, divide my inheritance between me and my brother. You know, we got some unfairness going on. And this one big moment that he has that's what he asks is from the creator of the universe. He, he asked this question. And he, he didn't have a better question to ask than that. That was it. Hey, let's talk about the money here. Divide by, you know, and Jesus is like, you know. And then the Pharisees trying to trick him with... Um, you know, is it wise to pay tribute unto Caesar? And Jesus is like, do you really get who I am? Do you really, really understand who I am? I am the, the Son of God. I'm the Savior of the world. And you're trying to ask me whether you should pay taxes to Caesar? Yeah, pay taxes to Caesar. I mean, Jesus didn't have the attitude that I have, but... But, yeah, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, render unto God what is God's. And so in John chapter 8, he has this, this interchange with, um, these are apparently people who are following him, because that's what it says in John. Let's turn to John chapter 8 just, just for a few minutes, because he has this interchange with people who were, by all accounts, at that point, following him, and it turns ugly pretty, pretty quickly. John chapter 8. Where is it? Okay, so maybe it was the Pharisees. It says, John chapter 8, verse 2, Then Jesus spake again unto them, I am the light of the world. He that follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Where does Jesus come across, get, where does Jesus get that he could say something like that? Can you imagine how offensive that is? If he wasn't who he said he was, that was like offensive. The Pharisees got offended and they are like, and the Pharisees therefore said unto him, Thou bearest record of thyself, the record is not true. And Jesus answered and said, 
Though I bear record of myself, yet my record is true. I know where I come from. I know where I go. But you can't tell where I come from and where I go. And they, this, this, this interchange gets even more heated as they go along. And um, they start making personal accusations against Jesus. Well, we're not, at least we're not the children of fornication. I mean, even after 30-something years, they're still throwing that back in Jesus' face about his mother um, being pregnant out of wedlock. Uh, you know, at least, at least we're not. Uh, and Jesus says, well, you're, you're of your, uh, you're of your uh, father, the devil. Uh, in verse 39, they answered and said unto him, uh, um, just in the middle of a thought, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now, verse 40, you seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth, which I have heard of God, and thus did Abraham. And um, so he's, they get on this track about Abraham, and um, why don't you go down to verse... Um, verse 51 Verily, verily, I say unto you, if a man keep my saying, he shall never see death. And this really irked him. And then the Jews said unto him, Now we know that thou hast a devil. Abraham is dead, and the prophets. And thou sayest, if a man keep my saying, he shall never seek death. Are you greater than our father Abraham, which is dead? And the prophets, which are dead? Who do you make yourself out to be? Who, do you, who are you? Who are you make? What are you, what are you talking about, Jesus? If I honor myself, Jesus answered, my honor is nothing. It is my Father that honors me, of whom you say that he is God. Yet ye have not known him, but I know him, and... Uh, if I should say, I know him not, I shall uh, be a liar like unto you, but I know him. And keep his sayings. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Oh my goodness. They said, then said the Jews unto him, Thou art yet fifty years old, thou, and thou hast seen Abraham. And Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. Amen. I am. So he was reading back the burning, I was there at the burning bush. Who do you say, Moses? Who, do, who should I say that I sent you? Tell him, I am. I am. I am. I am in the Old Testament. I am. Abraham was, but I am. Always there, always will be there. So, go, just go back a, a, a little bit to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. So the, the key to the parables is, is the sower sows the seed, seed is the word of God. And Jesus said, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. So Jesus, the word of God, the word was with God, and the word was God. The same was in the beginning, with God. That's how Jesus could say that before Abraham was I am. I was there from the beginning. I was the word of God. And Jesus in his parables was sowing that into our hearts to try and grow something that grow something new. The same was in the beginning uh, with God. All things were made by him. I was there at the creation. All things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. For in him was life, and the life was the light of men. And men, and the light shines in the darkness, and darkness didn't comprehend it. 
There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, that all men through him might believe. He was not the light, but was one that was sent to bear witness of the light, that it was the true light which lights every man that comes into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world didn't know him. The world knew him not. The world knew him not. So there he is, sitting in a boat, in his creation. The world was made by him. He's speaking words of truth. And the world didn't know who he was. Many people didn't know who he was. Some people had an inkling of who he was. Many people didn't. And he came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them he gave power to become sons of God. Even to them that believe, which were not born of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, as the glory of the only begotten Father, full of grace and truth. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and Jesus became the living, walking, talking, speaking Word of God. He walked on the earth, the Word of God, walking in, in human flesh, dwelling among men, speaking words of truth that, that still speaks to our lives today. That still speaks to our lives today. So, uh, you know, the question is, do you know him? Right? And have you spent time with him? We have, I mean, I look at my own life, right? How much time do I spend with the seed, the, with the walking, talking, living Word of God. I know I could do better. How about you? Amen. How about you guys? Could you do better? I could do better. I could certainly do better. Um, you know, he came to... Now I'm supposed to read my notes here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he's looking, so he's looking to, to uh, plant. He's looking to sow. He's looking to do that in our hearts. I wrote down a, a bunch of scriptures, but, uh, you know, and I scribbled this and that and all kinds of thoughts here. But I was, a, I was a young guy and somebody at Western New England College, you guys may have heard this before. I apologize. Maybe not all you did. And some old guy in a suit gave me one of these. And I had a job in Pittsfield, Massachusetts. I was working at General Electric. I had a great job. I felt like I was on top of the world because I uh, got out of college. I was making good money. I wasn't, I wasn't in some gutter somewhere. Um, and I just remember, I didn't know what being saved was. I didn't know the terminology. I was raised Catholic. I wasn't really a practicing Catholic or anything. And I remember reading the Word of God. What does it profit a man if he gains his own soul, but if he gains the whole world but loses his own soul? Or what would man give in exchange for his soul? And I thought, what a great question. And I was, I was reading through the Word of God and looking back on it now, I see the seed was being the parable of the sower was coming alive in my life. And my heart burned when I would read this. And I had no idea why. I had no idea why. I didn't know what being saved was. But God was saving me through his word and through the words of Christ that were being sown into my heart. And somewhere in there, there must have been a little bit of good soil because uh, it took root. It took root and it grew. 
So I was, I was just reading, I had a bunch of scriptures, you know, I, I went down this, this rabbit trail of, you know, what is, what is God doing me? I don't want you to turn to, to any of them except for maybe one um, at the end. So um, Galatians 1.16 where it says, To reveal his Son in me. Galatians 4.19, until Christ be formed in you. Paul's writing about Christ being formed in you. Ephesians 3.17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. There's this growth that happens in our lives. Romans 8.10, and if Christ be in you, the body of sin is dead. 2 Corinthians 4, seven, We have this treasure in earth, earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Right? We can only be so good in our own, you know, we can only make our... <laughs> we can try really hard. There are some people who are, and I, I admire them, who, who are just naturally good people. And, uh, and then you have people that are you look at them and their life's a total train wreck and you say, oh, how'd that happen? And, but it's the same God. We, the person who's living in disaster and train wreck is not that much different than us who appear to be, you know, somewhere, maybe we're not, you know, we all fall short of Christ and we all need him working in our lives. That the, the power may be of God, the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. In Colossians 1.27, says that there's Christ in us, the hope of glory. Christ in us, that, 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 that growth, spiritual growth in our lives, Christ in us, the hope of glory. So, um, let's just turn to Galatians chapter 2. We'll close there. We'll close in Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. Oh, this is good, so we can start a little early. A little earlier. Uh, verse 17, but, but while we seek to be justified by Christ... If we, but if, while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves are also found sinners, is, is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For through the law, for I through the law am dead to the law that I might live unto Christ. And what does, what does Paul say here? He says, but I'm crucified with Christ. I'm dead. Nevertheless, I live. And, and I think this is the essence of Christian life. If I, if I personally could pick out one scripture that would describe the, the, the essence, if I had to tell a person, what is being a Christian about? What is it really, you know, at the... You guys may have a different definition. You, you know, if, if I ask each one of you, tell me, tell me in one scripture... Tell me what, what, you know, you might say, well, to live is Christ, but to die is gain. Or, you know, you could, you could name whatever. For me, this is it. For I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live, in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness comes by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. But I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. In the life that I now live, I live in the flesh. I'm still here. I'm still here. But I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me and for you and for all of us. So... Anyways, I would say we're going to have communion today. I prefer you to come to me rather than someone to come to you. 
Uh, I just prefer it that way. And I would say, let's gather around and we can have a time of communion. We can have a time of prayer. And let's just seek God. This is what God gave me. I have a bunch of stuff. You know, I, I had like a bunch of different, you know, <laughs> talking in the book of Jude or talking from Exodus. Or, you know, I had all these things going around in my mind. And, and so I was praying, Lord, what, what is it that you would want me to, to just share today? And the Lord said that. And so let's just pray. Because I know I need it. I need, I need to draw closer to Christ. I need to spend more time in His Word. I need to have that, that uh, renewing of my mind every day. Because uh, our minds are a funny thing. They go in a lot of funny different places. And, uh, and many of them are not uh, lined up with the Word of God. And so, because we're human... We need the Word of God. We probably need it more than, than we, we have. Uh, at least I, I'm speaking from personal experience. could use more of the Word of God working in my life. Uh, the God of the Old Testament is God of the New Testament. Deuteronomy said, hey, put it on your doorpost. Put it on your, the, the forehead, you know, in your brain. You know, have it on your hands. And, you know, just... Blessed is the man who uh, who uh, meditates on the on the the Lord, the law of the Lord, day and night. It's like a tree planted by the river of water. It's going to be fruitful. And you know what? Eternity is a long time, brothers and sisters. The things of this world very short. The Word of God says. If we love the world, love not the world, neither the things of the world. For the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, those are enmity with God. And it's the Word of God. If we don't, if we don't have that constantly, all the time, just flowing into our lives, the, we just read, the, the, if you understand this parable, you'll understand all of them. There's stony ground, there's thorns, there's weeds, they choke things out. There's good ground. That's, that is like the key to everything else in our life, is that, is that one parable. How will, you, how will you understand all other parables? If you don't get this, is, is, there's a lot of stuff in life. And you need, to, you need to let Christ develop in you and grow in you and, and not get choked out. So let's do that. So anyways, if you guys are okay with this, are you guys all okay with this just coming up here? And we'll do communion like up here and then we'll... You guys okay with that? Yeah. Okay, let's, let's... Quick prayer. We thank you, Father, for your word. And we just look forward to uh, having this communion with you where you uh, then um, minister to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So come on up.